Merry New Year! Happy New Year. In this country, we say Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you for correcting my English with Steve. Like Cyber Radio, oh, oh, we're about to start the show. We talk about stuff and things. Lots of guests in depth interviewing. Like Cyber Radio, oh, oh, it's nobody's favorite show. Movies, comics, video games, and TV. And we also can. Welcome back to Mike Seibert Radio. I am your host. And as we say goodbye to 2023 and hello to 2024, I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about some of the topics that um, that have been on my mind that I haven't really had the time or opportunity to kind of give uh, depth and breadth to, you know, some of these topics we talk about tonight, you may have heard drips and drabs in other podcasts and other places, but I thought really getting into it here on Mike Seibert Radio would be um, uh, a lot of fun. And I'm being intentionally vague because I don't know how many episodes this will end up being. It awfully depends upon the length of the conversations. But um, I, as, as we end a year and begin a new one, it's uh, it's always good to take stock and count one's blessings. And one of the things I am uh, trying to be more thankful for and more grateful for is friendship and the friendships that I have in my life that I treasure um, incredibly deeply. And um, earlier this year, uh, back, at, back in the fall, actually, not, not all that long ago, um, I had the opportunity to travel to Orlando to attend TFCon LA. Um, I've talked about it in a couple different spots, but uh, one of the highlights of the year for me was uh, getting to meet in person finally after what feels like literally an entire eternity. It's literally, I would have waited an eternity for this. It's not over prime, but uh, joining me on this uh, uh, for this podcast is my friend, the owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the, the podcast, the website, and all those other things that the copy gets a little ropey after that, depending upon <laughs> what you're doing and where. So it's like, but I, I got to get the owner, operator, madman in there. It is the one and only it is my friend Ant from TFU.info. Hello. Thanks for joining me, buddy. <laughs> oh, so glad to be here. It was one of the highlights of my year, too, getting to hang out with you uh at, at tfcon and that was my entire tfcon experience i didn't go to the convention so right i i, I went and i hung out with you and and optimal mega diecast and i think that was it right it was the four of us and yeah that was the four of us yeah, yeah. At, at the unofficial podcasters round table yeah we should have recorded that <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh well and it's and it's interesting too because like I, you know i i don't know how much tfcon we're 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 going to talk about here but like i do feel much like any time I tell convention stories, it always seems to have like an asterisk or or a uh, proviso to it. I um I spent that weekend not always being at my best, and I um I had not realized I had made this mistake until I I and, and I actually talked to you about this later. Um, I was I wasn't necessarily sick, but I was like in a funk, and turns out. Um, being a grown ass man, age of 45, didn't realize that you don't drink the water in Florida. Who mm -hmm. knew? <laughs> and I, uh, I am a water baby. I, I drink a glass of water like all the time and it, uh, it started catching up to me. And I think, I think that kind of colored some of my interactions. Like, I think, uh, I think it was on Saturday, but I, uh, shared an elevator with Josh Burcham. 
Uh, and he's like, I think he recognized me either from like Twitter or podcasting or something. And he's, and I'm just kind of sitting there being, being various shades of green. And he's like, I'm like, Oh, you having a good show? He's like, yeah, I'm having a great show. He's like, hi, I'm Josh Burcham. You're really enthusiastic. I'm like, yeah, Hey, I'm like, what's up? You know, I was, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't rude, but I wasn't like up like I, like I, like I usually am like that enthusiasm kind of uh, dipped. So hopefully that wasn't as noticeable to uh, uh, folks that that interacted with me. But um, uh, but Aunt, while I got you here, uh, we're we're talking a little bit about um, October. I do um, I do have to tell a story that I think I've told before, but I don't remember. Um, I lose track. Um, so we're uh, we're having dinner on Thursday night, and um, at that point on my Thursday journey, I'd been. I'd been out for a while. I I had uh, I had since made my way to the hotel bar and had connected with uh, um, uh, Optimal Omega and Diecast and maybe some of those Roma collectors knuckleheads and and assorted assorted bar people, um, including somebody who introduced me to a cocktail that I will never have again. Um, and have you heard of, well, actually it's not, it's not an actual cocktail, but like I'm a Jack and Coke guy. I, I like Coke. I like Jack Daniels. I'm a Jack and Coke guy. There are people walking this earth that are rum and Coke folks. You know, no, no offense. I, you know, I mean, uh, no offense. I mean, nothing against that. I've since retired from that life. Too much sugar for me. There, there, there are other people walking this earth that are Captain Morgan's and Coke people, which to me just sounds like. Armageddon. Um, you know, I mean, again, say what you will about the spicy rum, but um, not a not my deal. But I uh, I I chatted with this dude. I think his name was Dave. But um, he was like, um, I'm like, what you drinking over there? He's like, well, I'm I'm a it's a it's a thing of my own own making. It's a it's a it's Jack Daniels. It's a, a Captain Morgan and Coke. And I'm like, huh. And I was far enough in my journey to where I thought, you know what? I, I'm going to try this. And I have uh, the nice lady instead of making me a Jackie Coke, she makes me what she dubbed the, uh, uh, the bartender there, um, called it a Captain Jack, Captain Jack Sparrow. And it's, uh, it's, it's Jack, it's Captain Morgan, it's Coke. And I had one of those. <laughs> so, and that was, that was kind of enough to get me where I'm going. So, so by the time my buddy Ant makes the the scene and catches up with us, I've drank a bunch of Florida water, and and I've I've had probably a couple beers and one of these uh, Captain Jack nonsense, not up to and including whatever we had while we were there before before dinner. This is all set up to we eventually adjourn from the hotel bar to go have dinner at the hotel restaurant, which was which was very close by. And uh, since we were all on different pages, you know, uh, uh, some folks got dessert. Um, I got myself a, a enormous steak dinner for no apparent reason. Oh, I know why. Because th there, there was a note on the menu that says, ask us about our steak specials. And I'm like, excuse me, nice lady. I would like to ask about your steak specials. And she's like, we got steak. Good enough for me. <laughs> it's like we have both kinds. We have we have country and Western. And I'm like, OK, fine, whatever. Um, so, but uh, as as we're all hanging around having this uh, not unofficial podcasters panel, I mean, it, it was a great hang, a uh, great visit. But then, like, as you do in convention season or convention times, other friends show up, you know, uh, and there's this group of folks. I don't even remember who all was in it, but I know it was led by uh, my friend Trish from uh, More Than Meets the Ear uh, podcast. She's also one of the uh, uh, volunteers at TFCon. Like, so she travels and volunteers at TFCon and all that. But anyway, she rolls up to me. She's like, oh, hey, Mike, how's it going? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, how was Disneyland? Blah, 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 blah. And then, um, and then, and then my good friend, aunt sitting next to me very politely says, um, hey, so uh, you, um, you got, you going to introduce us to your other friends? <laughs> and I'm like, 
No, <laughs> because like, I think I had, I had hit a spot in my mental faculties where I'm like, oh, I don't know if I have the bandwidth to make all these connections. So immediately, like, like muscle memory, I start going into podcast intro. My, I'm like, I'm like, this is diecast from one of the longest running podcasts in, in Transformers and, and all that. And finally, when I get around to like, yeah, owner operator, mad man, he's like, you don't need to do that. You don't, you don't need, hi, 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 I'm Anthony. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, all right. So, and then after that, we were all good. But, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, and, and, th- and that was a Thursday night in, in Orlando. I really had no point of that story other than to uh, uh, talk about one of the terrific interactions we had. I, I, I think of that fondly. Yeah, and I, you know, it's funny. I, uh, it, part of that, part of that, that that response for me too was like, I kind of recognized Trisha's voice, but I didn't want to mm-hmm. guess because I do listen to more than meets the ear, <laughs> and 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 I'm a fan of the show, so I didn't want to be like, are you the person I think who's, and also I, I could not remember her name, <laughs> so right? Like, no, you gotta, yeah, you remind me of the name. Um, yeah, and and so that that was part of it, and then you just reminded me of something I going way back in this conversation uh, yes to uh on on the jack and coke uh subject so uh yeah i tend to be like if i'm gonna drink a, a mixed drink it's probably gonna be jack and coke mm-hmm. um what i i was at a party a friend's birthday and they had this like bar her and her husband had this bar set up uh in their backyard and so me and someone else we went over to it and i'm like oh, i, I kind of want a jack and coke and so i pour the coke and then i look and i'm like he doesn't have a whiskey. He doesn't have a Jack. He like closest thing he had was Johnny Walker. And I was like, okay. And it was Johnny Walker black. And I'm like, I'm not going to be the person that opens his bottle of Johnny Walker black. <laughs> so, so I'm like, maybe after later. And I tried it later uh, with Coke. Not, not as good as I thought it would be. Um, but what I did try by accident, really, he had a uh, screwball, which I don't know if you ever had screwball. Is that the peanut butter whiskey? Yes, it is. So I put that in the Coke. Um, <laughs> and it is it 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 might be a little like it's like having it's like eating a Reese's peanut butter cup and washing it down with Coke like it's that kind of sweetness level. Okay, <laughs> but um, but it was good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's something to try out next time uh, if 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 you need a substitute. Uh, yeah, screwball and Coke. I I I just might do that. <laughs> I have a, a sister-in-law who like when I mean she she must have bought stock in Screwball like when when that first came around. Because like for like three Christmases in a row, she brings like this bottle of screwball and I'm just like, what do we do with it? Oh, well, you just you just drink it. I'm like, I'm not just going to I'm not going to shoot peanut butter whiskey at Christmas. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it in like a like a I don't know, like a warm cup of milk or something like a like a normal human being or something. Um, Yeah. That's yeah, screwball, wacky. I'm not. I'm not the biggest peanut butter person, okay. uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I I will I will give that a try. You uh you you want to you want to give that a, a creative cocktail name like uh like our our friend the bartender with the I I do think Captain Jack Sparrow is is a cool name for for that for that particular cocktail. But I digress. Yeah, no, let me let me think on that one. <laughs> Got it. Very good, very good. We we can litigate that off uh offline. Um. So actually, well, uh, before we transition into you know actual content and uh, and you know meat of stuff, um, so basically, like, so when when you hung out with us at, at TFCon uh, on Thursday, that that was it, right? You just uh, uh, popped in, had a had dinner and drinks with us, and that that was the entirety of your your TFCon experience. Right? Yeah, I mean, that was it was my it all. Oh, whenever they do it in Orlando, it lands on my daughter's birthday weekend, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, they couldn't, they couldn't, you know, couldn't be in two places at once. So I was able to do the night before, um, cause she would, she would have been asleep and, you know, and, you know, I, um, and she's at that age now, especially at five where it's like, no, she remember she, not only does she remember things like, oh my God, I can't believe you remembered. I'm like, I remember being five. So like, I'm like, mm-hmm. these are things that are going to sit with her. <laughs> for the rest right. Of her life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's like you went to go hang out yeah. with, with with your friends on my birthday. Yeah. So so oh, no. So gosh. yeah. So I had I had to make sure I was home. Uh, and and yeah, we had a party and everything else. So it, it was it worked out. They worked out that, that we were able to hang the night before. It was great meeting you and Optimal Omega. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've known Diecast for years because we used to cover Toy Fair together. So uh, so mm-hmm. we go way back. No, that's that's awesome. That was a great time. And I I would say throwing a uh, mild shots across the bow. I think you spent more time at TFCon than Brian Kilby did um yeah so i've like, heard so i've heard yeah. <laughs> and and i i would have liked to have met him 
because like, you know, we're, you know, he's, he's who he is and, you know, we're, we're mutuals on Twitter and, you know, he and I have talked a little bit, but I wouldn't say we're like, you know, homies or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's like that, that would have been cool to, to check off my list. And, uh, and I, I saw a tweet from him, like at like, I don't know, like noon on Saturdays, like, well, I got what I needed from TFCon. Bye. <laughs> And was never seen or heard from ever again. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, I know he went, he he took his family to SeaWorld. And I was like, man, if this was any other weekend, I've got annual passes. I could have met you. <laughs> oh, man. Man, think about what could have been. Jeez. Yep. Crazy. Well, um, so... We have we we've called this meeting of the minds to talk about a, a handful of different uh, topics that have been kind of resonating with us for for the last I don't know handful of months or so. Um, Ant and I are in a uh, I, I don't I don't know. Do you call it X or are we calling it Twitter? I don't I don't. I, don't I, know I, I still call it Twitter, but I'm probably defiant in that. Uh, I'm starting to see a changeover. Of people calling it X slash Twitter or, or just yes. calling it X. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I will probably call it Twitter until I leave the platform permanently. <laughs> same. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very much in, uh, the, the same boat. I kind of take the associated press, uh, style suggestion, you know, uh, X comma, the platform formerly known as Twitter, that, that kind of thing. So, but, um, but anyway, we, uh, we have a, uh, text thread that, you know, he and I just, you know, sometimes it's shooting the breeze. Sometimes it's bouncing show ideas off of um, other times. It's like, you know, heads up on cool bargains um, or, or whatever's, but there's also like an underlying theme and I should like rename the text thread uh, existential dread. That's where, that's where that, that title and that naming convention actually comes from is from, from our correspondence. I keep, uh, I keep saying like, well, man, yeah, we really should do like the existential dread cast and really chat about like, you know, some of this, some of this stuff that that seems to um, resonate with us. So, so we're gonna chat uh, later on about kind of I don't know the the for lack of a better term the the state of how we look at social media and podcasting. Are are those platforms dead? Is this is this you know uh, is uh, is this content dead? That that kind of thing. Um, you know, all through the lens of being a couple of. Uh, Transformers podcasts, and I think there's um, there's some meat on that bone that, uh, um, a, as I like to say, occasionally. But I think before we get too bogged down into that, because I, I think that's going to be heavier uh, content. Um, I think let's start with, um, and even before we get into like uh, uh, comics and things like that, let's uh. Let's kind of talk about toys because, you know, recently uh, Christmas is, has uh, come and gone. Um, I'm sure we're on the cusp of year-end sales and things like that. Like, it's interesting, though. Like, I haven't really seen a whole lot of, like, American Boxing Day stuff. And usually, like, my Amazon is, like, rotten with, like, good sales and stuff. And I haven't really seen anything, um, which is fine because I have, over the last several months, um, even at deep, steep discounts, I think I have annihilated whatever I thought my my uh, toy spending budget was going to be to the point where basically I just gave up on my spreadsheet. Um, I, I have entire entries that's just Ross, 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 uh, Ross dash toy drive, uh, Ross dash homie hookup, that that kind of thing. <laughs> so I, so I, I, I guess I would like to start by talking about what I call... Uh, the Ross effect. And it's basically like, you know, and I, I've heard other um, toy related content creators talk about it a little bit, but maybe not as deeply as I would like as a listener. So kind of taking kind of that, that Kevin Smith ethos, it's like, well, if you want to do something, do it yourself. So, um, and I thought, and as I po posted in our, in our um, uh, chat, um, I, I have some crackpot theories. I have some thoughts, but one of the things I, I go to my buddy aunt for is, um, a, a more logical, clear headed analysis. Like, like this is the dude who, uh, broke down 
how the war in Ukraine relates to <laughs> toy prices, which again, I had never heard anybody else in the, in the space say that. So that, that, that got a lot of credibility for me. I was like, well, yeah, because if, if oil prices go up and toys are made out of plastic, plastic comes from petroleum, petroleum comes from oil. Yeah. Of course, if there's oil shortages, that's going to um, affect toy prices. And that was even before we got into, you know, uh, uh, inflation and any of the other uh, factors that that we'll, we'll probably try to skirt against as as briefly as we can without making it a political discussion. But um, but anyway, so I, I guess for for my take on it, because I once I kind of got into the Ross cycle, I guess, for lack of a better term, I've uh, I've kind of been all in. Like I hit th there. There is a Ross Dress for Less store that is in between my house and my work, and it's literally I get off the exit, go down one stoplight, pop into Ross, and then go out of Ross and go up to the next exit, get back on the freeway and go to work. Like I I can be in and out in fifteen minutes. So it so it adds no additional time to my commute. Um, and it doesn't add any extra time to my day. And because of that, it's kind of caused me to become um a little obsessed. Like I never would have thought that I would have been like this this uh Ross dress for less uh uh dumpster diving bargain hunter. That that's not necessarily the type of uh toy hunting that I do, but what I discovered is that I got bit by the bug and it's infectious and it becomes kind of a thrill of the hunt situation like to where I'm getting getting a charge out of finding toys that I don't know if I even want um so that that could be part of the the legislation here but um uh, let me let me take a a little bit of a, a step back cuz I I think I kind of got more into my end of it without kind of explaining the history. I uh, Back in early October, maybe late September, uh, there were sightings of, um, I, I would say, sought-after toys at Ross Dress for Less. Ross Dress for Less is basically a discount outlet type of store that sells predominantly clothes, uh, but they also have a variety of other things, you know, like sundries and accessories and some home decor, but they've always had a toy section. And over the last several years, there have been sightings of um, Hasbro products, Transformers products, like some, some of the uh, Siege line ended up at Ross, like there were signs of uh, Siege Springer, uh, Siege um, Starscream. Uh, Earthrise Astro Train ended up there um, at deeper discounts. Like there was like a movie masterpiece Ironhide that uh, showed up there at one point. But these were in pretty limited quantities and they got snapped up pretty quick. And these are toys that are showing up at deep discount. So like um, Voyager and Deluxe figures would be between like $6.99 and $8.99. I don't remember how much that movie masterpiece Ironhide went for because I don't care. It's, you know, it's just so far off my radar, but it was kind of a blip and, you know, other stuff sh shows up there from time to time, like Fortnite figures and, you know, um, nothing that that's particularly remarkable to us in the toy hunting community. But then late, Oct uh, late September, early October rolls around suddenly uh, Target exclusive buzzworthy Bumblebee stuff start showing up. Uh, there's sightings of uh, Studio Series 86 Cup. There's sightings of uh, Studio Series 86 Cliff Jumper. And around the same time, now I don't know if these are, you know, all chronologically, but the thing that really got the toy hunting community um, kind of whipped up into a fever a bit is the. A uh, Velocitron line started showing up. Uh, that being the Walmart exclusive. Um, let me see if I get it right here. Oh, thank you. So it it, it is the um, 
uh, what is it? The uh, I can't my the Elastatron I, Speedia 500 collection. That's what it was. Yep. That's what it was. Um, well, I, Transformers Generations. Uh, oh yes. you know the 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 Velocitron <laughs> Speedia 500 uh, collection. Um, so anyway, it's this capsule program where it's you know it's a you know it's a it's a line of you know repaints and redecos and it's a Walmart exclusive line and some of those figures ended up being pretty scarce and pretty rare. Um, you can't see it in the video, but uh, uh, the example that Ant hold it up was uh, was a Crasher, the you know uh, Renegade now Decepticon, uh, you know GoBot no more. I still think instead of calling her uh, Decepticon Crasher, why couldn't you just call her Renegade Crasher? I think that would have been cool. Um, ju- you know, just have that be her name. You know, like Autobot Jazz or something like that. Just call her Renegade Crasher. I th- thought that would be pretty metal. But I'm with you on that. Uh, real quick, they, they it's mm. the first time they've called her Crasher. Uh, they've done homages before as Fracture, but they've never done one as Crasher. That's right. That's right. I wonder if they just recently cleared the the naming rights or something, or they needed a Decepticon in front of it to clear the name. Mm. <laughs> so that might be part of why it has that. Gotcha. Again, i.e. Autobot Jazz. You know, that 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 kind of same uh, naming convention. Uh, but anyway, so these Velocitron figures start showing up. Um, uh, amongst the rare figures are the aforementioned Crasher. There's also uh, the Sideswipe of the group, uh, Clampdown. He was uh, relatively rare. Um, but the most elusive figure of all, that being Velocitron uh, Cosmos, started showing up at Ross. And I think that was the thing that really got people's attention. And that's, I think that's really kind of what got me into the game was like, not only are these showing up, but these are showing up with regularity to the point where, I don't know, for for me, I don't know. And everything is amplified through the lens of social media, but it almost feels like at this point, more uh, more cosmoses have been found at Ross than were ever found at Walmart. So I think, and and I'm sure that's hyperbole and a and an exaggeration, but it just like with the amount of enthusiasm with which folks are posting their uh, cosmos finds and crasher finds. Um, nobody really seems to care about finding clampdown, which is fine. Um, but I mean, well, and it, and it cracks me up just to tangent for a sec. Clampdown was also one per case, just like cosmos. But like nobody cares about clampdown, I guess. But whatever. That's because that mold has been done a bunch of times, as you know. <laughs> as I do know. Yeah. And I... and clampdown won't complete somebody's 85, 84, 85 Autobot team. So that that that's the two reasons you probably see Cosmos being more people being more interested in it, though they're probably the same number of both. Got it. See, that's why we have you on is the, <laughs> you know, because seriously, it's like I, I have like crackpot theories and 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 weird perspectives, but not always the uh, uh, the the right wisdom with which to um, apply it. Um, so anyway, like so I I start hitting Ross in earnest. Uh, like I'd mentioned, there was one very close to me, but I was also hunting in 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 uh, uh, other stores as well. And it appealed to me for a number of different reasons. One, the aforementioned thrill of the hunt. Like my wife had asked me at one point, she was like, what, what are you doing with all this stuff? Um, and I, I, we kind of had like that come to Jesus moment where I, I told her, I go, and I didn't even realize this until I thought about it. And I told her, I go, I don't know if it's so much about what I find and what I can do with it. I just enjoy the thrill of the hunt. Like, like there is something that there, there's a little bit of a charge and a little bit of a kick when you find something that's actually like kind of remarkable. Um, so, but then through this, seeing like these very enticing price points, like seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine, sixteen ninety nine for a scourge, that that kind of thing. Um, I'm already thinking about my uh, uh, toy drive that we have at work, and that's really what kicks me into. Um, not just hunting, but like purchasing. Like I, I'm buying like Star Wars Black Series, Marvel Legends, uh, Power Rangers Lightning Collection. I'm just like, I, you know, I I see six inch figures for five ninety nine, and I'm just I'm just gobbling them up. Um, and it, I I thought it was really cool. Like you know, just before uh Christmas there to go to my local uh um Toys for Tots, uh which they had their their warehouse very close to me. 
also on my way to work, ironically enough, I come in with just like these heaving Ross bags. And the uh, um, the guy who was running the spot is a is an active Marine. And he's like, well, let me take you back through the warehouse. So I got like a whole tour of like the whole Toys for Tots operation there. It's like this. So this is where donations go. They get sorted and they get put over here. And, uh, you know, and then this is where they go out for, you know, families that have made requests. And and it, it was a really cool experience. Like I hadn't seen like the behind the scenes of that kind of stuff before. So I I, I was grateful for that opportunity. But like prior to that, that's also what was kind of driving my interest. And because I'm just I'm just picking up cheap toys. But it's it's cheap toys that for lack of better word are cool. You know, like it's it's one thing to go to a discount store like a like a Ross or a Marshalls or a TJ Maxx or or a uh, Poundland or something like that. I want to get Pound Town reference in there. Uh, but no, it's like it's one thing to pick up like you know, cheap toys, you know, our, our friends over at, um, a uh, radio free Cybertron do, uh, elf on a shelf warmer where, you know, they, they try to clear, um, you know, peg warming stock to get new stuff in there and get toys for kids. Um, that's, I guess for me, that's what part of what the Ross effect is. It's like, it, it gave me the opportunity to get some really cool stuff at, uh, at deep, deep discounted prices for uh to donate to the toy drive but then it becomes it's kind of like a uh one for me one for the toy drive and one for my friends like i uh, i shipped a scourge off to australia because even after the um the uh shipping and duty and all that it was still cheaper than what they go for down there um and then it becomes like, um, I mean, I've, I've, I think I've hooked up uh, like four different crashers for folks. And so it becomes like th- this, this, uh, again, that, that the whole theme of thrill of the hunt, it's like, you know, what can I find for my friends? What can I find for myself? And this was before ARC started showing up, um, that kind of thing. So anyway, th- this is a very long winded uh, intro to say like not only is it um, quote unquote good toys but it started off as ones that were more rare and more sought after uh, it was store exclusives you know it was, it was um, uh, buzzworthy bumblebee stuff from target it was all the velocitron stuff that I just talked about from walmart and it started agitating this question in my head it's like where is this stuff coming from why is it here and when does it end like i uh i did a um i i was on world's charity live stream for extra life uh back in the beginning of november and i think even then because i recently just posted the the recordings of that um i even said something like oh man i think velocitron is done i haven't seen anything for like a week and that that was like on November 4th. And like the week later, I saw like a half dozen scourges on a shelf. And it's gotten so weird. I've tweeted about this a couple times. Now it's gone the other direction where I was so enthusiastic and uh, voracious and maybe a little obsessed as well of just you know you know what can i find what what can i send to people you know i sent michael andrews a bunch of headmasters for his birthday you know that that kind of stuff um but like i started to get what i can only describe as collector apathy like um the aforementioned a uh, wall of scourges i walked into a ross one day i saw literally seven scourges on the shelf and i didn't buy a damn one of them and and i felt nothing and i'm just like oh yeah it's scourge i i I almost put out a snarky tweet i'm like well if you can't find scourge at this point it's your own fault you know that's not a very nice thing to say but that that that's that's me just i guess flaunting my privilege of like you know having that accessibility but but it was it was kind of starting to get to me and then um a couple weeks ago i uh i i hit a i hit a ross on my way home and I, oh, I'm missing a huge chunk of the story, but let me, let me finish this part. But like, I, I, I hit my Ross on my way home from work 
which is different than the one I hit on my way to work. And I found a crasher and the box was kind of beat up. Um, and I picked it up, went to the register. I saw that the line was too long. I was bored and I just set it back down. I'm just like, I, I, I don't care. You know, for, for a figure that a year ago was 40 bucks or more on, on the secondary market. And I have it in my hand for seven ninety nine, And I'm so apathetic at this point that I just set it down and um, didn't, uh, didn't buy it. Le- left it for the next collector. Um, but I, I had realized in telling my, my crasher story that I, I left out a key component and I remembered why I left this out. Um, um, a week before that, uh, before, before my crasher apathy story, I found a cosmos, finally found one. And it's, uh, um, in fact, given the, the release schedule that this will actually have come out after, uh, I've, I've gifted it. So good thing we're not doing a live stream. I just now thought about all this all too late, but like, um, I, I have a buddy of mine who like, you know, um, even like at the very beginnings, he's like, man, I'm really looking for, looking for a cosmos. And I'm like, you know what, buddy, if, uh, if I find it, it's yours. So I kept my promise. It was like, it is like, I don't even need a cosmos for myself. It's like, yeah, he, he's cute. He's fun. He looks like a cool figure. And I'm glad that, you know, the folks that, that have him like him, but he's not in the movie. So I don't need him for my shelf. And I, I would get more joy out of making sure that somebody who is looking for it gets it, that, that kind of thing. It's like, so I kind of, I, I think I've referred to it in other spaces as like, kind of like white hat toy hunting. Like, I'm I'm on the hunt, but not for myself, not not to keep for myself, nor to flip. I'm looking, and I've sold a couple things, but I don't think I've I've charged anything nearly close to like TFCon prices. I went to TF, so TFCon happens during the height of Ross, and I I actually spent double the Ross price for a Studio Series eighty six Cliff Jumper because I was convinced. I was never going to see one ever again. I had, um, I thought I had come across one and, uh, the box was all beat up, so I didn't want it. But, um, as soon as I got back, like literally like that Tuesday after I got home, I saw two of them on the shelf at my local Ross. I was like, God damn it. But, but you don't know when this stuff is going to end. You know, it's like, is, is this one and done? And that's when I started going, um, like more or less every day or like every other day or every third day or something like that. Because the thing I didn't notice at first is that stock was being replenished. Um, I just thought it was very similar to a few years ago where it's like, okay, so yeah, here's a, here's a, um, a siege Springer, a siege star scream and an Earthrise Astro train. And then that's it ever. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I think and I'm just now litigating this out loud. I'm really thinking out loud. But like, I think after I found that Cosmos, um, I think subconsciously something clicked in me to where it's like, oh, I found the thing I was looking for. What am I still looking for? You know, I'm sure I'll grab an arc if they've got one. Never found an arc. Um, and I, I, was, I was chatting with, uh, with my friend Apollo not too long ago because like, you know, anytime you post something on like Twitter or Facebook, it's like, hey, man, I'm going to Ross. Anybody looking for anything? I'm looking for Cosmos. Yeah, y- you and everyone else. Who isn't? Look for look for Clampdown or something. Somebody ask for a Clampdown. Does anyone need a Tomax and Zamot? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you wish you could get Zamot. It is all Tomax all the time, uh, which is a shift because like when they first started showing up, they, they were even. Like I bought, I bought two sets of the two, uh, specifically for the toy drive. And then like the week before Christmas, maybe, maybe the week before that, um, all the Zaymots vanished and more Tomaxes came in. So at every Ross I go to, I can find a dozen Tomaxes, but not a single Zaymot. It's so weird. That's strange. You know, I find them. I just haven't been at Ross and Florida is an interesting place because there are Rosses everywhere. I mean, mm-hmm. not even like 
Oh yeah, there's a lot of them. Like there's an obscene amount of there are Rosses in shopping centers directly across the street from one another. <laughs> um, I went to one shopping center. There's one shopping center that has two Rosses on opposite sides of the parking lot. <laughs> so, oh my gosh! So like there are so many Rosses down here. It, it's and, and I didn't really do the big toy hunt. I went to one or two. Like if I was near one, I went in, but. Uh, but I didn't like make like a like a, a Ross like hunting journey like like I would when I lived back in New York. And we, I kind of have my my route of Walmart, Target, and then what other stores you know if I needed to stop on the way. Um, and Ross is not up there for that matter. Um, but right. Um, but to the Tomax and Zaymont thing, just it's funny. I I would find um, that either one store would have one or or the other, or there would be. Tomox is all at one part of the store and Zaymot's all at another side of the store. Like how they had that, like a lot of them had a bin in the front by the register, by the line yep. that had a whole bunch of stuff. So there would be like Zaymot's in there, but Tomax is in the back toy section. So that's how, that was the, my, my one Tomax Zaymot kind of story with that. That's, that's wild. Well, and, and that kind of, that kind of underscores one of the other things that that's puzzling. And, and I swear I'm going to ask you some questions at some point. I know it's just, it's, it's, it's my way. <laughs> Brevity is not my first best strength, but no, it's, um, I, I began to become more puzzled by what was actually showing up. You know, I, again, I would see those store exclusives, but then I would also see like some weird mainline stuff, like, like a lot of the, well, not a lot of them. The the G.I. Joe Classified series that would pop up would be Stalker and Tomax and Zamot. And just those three, pretty much exclusively at first. Then the weird exclusive stuff started coming in, starting with um uh Tiger Force Duke with uh with the Ram uh cycle. Um, I ended up finding a couple of those. Um, I've found that apparently there's as much of a Joe classified a collector community as there are transformers because I've never seen a Viper three pack at, um, at Ross. Um, what's the other thing folks are looking for? I, I saw, uh, I found barbecue, the Marauders barbecue at one. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't pick it up. I, I passed on a lot. I mean, I didn't really buy much of anything, but, but mm -hmm. I looked just to see what was there. Cause I, 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 like you, I was just interested to see like, what is showing up? What, what is here and the Marauders barbecue. And I feel like there was one other figure in that wave that I might've seen, but yeah, that was strange to me when I saw those. People were, were saying like, um, Dusty was part of that and cover girl as well. Um, they, they were all in the same wave. No, Dusty was in the Zorana wave. I think there was Rana's as well, but like I, I've never seen any of those at Ross. Um, ironically enough, on Amazon you can get them on, get them pretty cheap. If if you're paying more than fifty fifteen bucks for a Zorana or a Dusty, you're paying too much. Um, which you know it, it's. I'm getting ahead of myself because I was going to talk about the Ross effect. It seems to be kind of uh, lowering prices on um, on a lot of things. So let me get to my crackpot theory. I feel where is this stuff coming from? My feeling is that it's still COVID leftovers. Like this was stuff that was stuck on trucks. Um, I'm sorry, stuck on uh, stuck in containers, stuck on ships, stuck in warehouses. And by the time these things were excavated, they were old merchandise. So Velocitron was last year. So if you roll up to Walmart now, meaning like the distribution company with a truck full of Velocitron stuff. It's like, oh, no, thank you. That that stuff is expired, expired, expired. So to instead of going on the shelf at your local Walmart, they go to the discount store. Now, I don't know what kind of distribution deal uh, Walmart has with Ross. I don't know what kind of distribution deal Target has with Ross or if that's any of that at all, because thinking this out loud and saying it out loud, I believe this is all straight from Hasbro to Ross because that's the, that's the common denominator. Why are you getting target exclusive stuff and Walmart exclusive stuff along with mainline stuff? I, I think one of the things that I would like to talk about is kind of Hasbro's ongoing distribution problems. Like, 
I I don't know if this is systemic of that, if this is like a a symptom of that, or if this is an effect um, of that. But so in typical Mike Seibert fashion, I set up 42 minutes of story and runway building, laying a lot of track. Um, Anthony Brucali, TFU.info, why do you think this is happening? Oh, boy. Um, well, I feel like this is something I, I think you're on the right track with this is a remnant of COVID. Um, I think this is it, it. There's some effects here that are very interesting. And when you think about that, the, these are last year's figures in the most part. There's a, there's a couple of things that pop to mind for me. Um, you got to rewind, though. We have to rewind ourselves back to this time last year, right? Ah. So end of year last year, right? We were in the middle of, you know, um, the, you know, the great, uh, I had a term for it. It was, it was like, you know, the, the pre-order fulfillment rush of 2022, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because, because things were stuck on ships and because things were so slow to get in and because they feel like retailers overordered, right? Um, because they were they had empty shelves and they were trying to fulfill and nothing was coming in. Uh, we hit this glut right around the end of last year where a lot of pre-orders from the beginning of the year and the middle of the year were being filled, plus all the new product was showing up all at the same time. And it was all being fulfilled at once. I know, I know it caused me as a collector to take a step back and go, what am I doing? Like, because this is hitting me hard all at once. Um, wasn't, you know, I think a lot of collectors looked at that and was like, okay, I need to slow down my spending. I need to slow down my collecting because I can't do this all at once. And this is a lot to take on. I think from that, right, you had people pull away from collecting and pull away from buying stuff and even cancel orders or send stuff back. I think you also had, on top of that, you had the new year 2023 price increase. So you had figures that uh, that the, the prices kind of just jumped up. And so what happened is now you slowed people's purchasing into 2023. So now you have less product moving, less new product moving in. And, you know, the the Hasbro relationship, and I, I, I think I'm with you there that this is a Hasbro and side of things and not a Walmart target retailer things. Um, this is nothing new. So it's just that the volume of toys and not even just the volume of toys, the volume of outlets that received these toys because it wasn't just ross it was tj maxx it was you know tj maxx marshalls it was burlington code factory uh uh had toys uh city trends ollie's uh you know there's a lot of stores that that picked up this stock um and in the past you know we used to refer to this as as market six this is the old hasbro term uh, called Market Six, and that's what these store- stores are, um, because it used to be that there were five big retailers. There was Toys R Us, Walmart, Target, uh, Kmart, and I'm missing one. Uh, uh, at, let's call it Amazon, just for argument's sake. And then that's the five, and then number six would be uh, the smaller stores, the big lots, the f- five belows. The speaking of which, how have you? I can't believe you've never been to five below. I, did, I thought they were an, a national thing. Uh, <laughs> I heard no. that on the on the world uh, stream. Um, and just for your own knowledge, uh, five below is a store. It's like a dollar store, but in reverse. It's everything is five dollars or less. Um, but and and now due to inflation, there's a five beyond section where things are more than five dollars. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I think, so you have this effect of one, the price increase two inflation, and then three, the, the pre-order glut of the end of 2022. And so that probably left a lot of things with old, a lot of old stock in somebody's warehouse. Let's presume it's Hasbro. So if they've got to move this out, it probably costs them more to hold on to it than to liquidate it. Um, and that pushes it into, into these stores. Um, you know, a funny thing is, as you were talking about Velocitron, the thing that, that clicked in my head is that on one of the Hasbro calls that we were on with the, on the one of the fan meter calls they used to do, uh, they did a whole, you know, they were, we had asked them about the Voyager hot rod that was supposed to be in this line. And they were like, nope, that's canceled. <laughs> and and so there's always been a lot of speculation about why, but like that was canceled. Like the the, the thought was it was canceled because of movie product. So on top of all the stuff that's that now has been pushed from the end of 2022, you also have this glut of product 
that are taking up space in your Walmarts and Targets of of Rise of the Beast line stuff. So there, there's a lot of product out there. There's a lot of segmenting of the audience out there. Um, and I don't know how much things are moving. So that's probably what forced a lot of the stuff into Ross. I mean, even look at Walmart. Walmart repacked toys from last year as a Black Friday special. Um, you know, the sales this year were re- less sales last year. You know, the discounts last year were not that good at the holiday season. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of big deals to be had this year. There's been a lot of deals to be had from the the ten dollar uh, movie retro figures that Walmart did, the, the the Black Friday figures that they did. Target had Transformers on sale at least two or three times. Uh, throughout throughout the holiday season, Amazon discounted almost all, you know as they always tend to do discount a lot of their exclusives. Nova Prime got really cheap and and disappeared. Um, some of the the two packs didn't come down. I, I was eyeballing those two uh, those two two packs and they didn't come down to a place where I wanted them. But but they they even hit the sale you know line at some point. Um, so all that's a long way of saying that um, the product on the shelves hasn't moved. There's like a there's a handful of different log jams and so that forced the old product to get shipped off to uh, these stores but these stores have been getting old product uh you know tail usually what collective community likes to call tail enders because it usually happens at the end of a line um your story about sending a skirt to your friend in australia reminded me of one of the first times that i can remember this is back at the end of uh the first run of um was it universe 2.0 no, it was Universe 1.0 slash Reveal the Shield. Um, that that lot part of the line, um, there were tail unders there that didn't really show up in Walmart, didn't show up at Target, didn't show up at Toys R Us, but showed up in Australia. And so it was it was wheel and it was it was wheeljack, it was jazz, it was uh, I think there was a Rekgar in that wave. And they they all I had a buddy of mine in Australia ship me a whole bunch and I had to pay the shipping and the tax. Well, I was yeah, like, yeah. still still cheaper than buying it on eBay. And then three months later, they these showed up at TJ Maxx and mass like for months on end for, you know, probably eight bucks each, I think, because they were they were twelve ninety nine retail at that point. So. You know, this is something that has existed um, for a pretty long time. The tail enders usually show up. I was just thinking that too. Like, um, there's still one figure I don't own from the Transformers Prime line, and that is a uh, uh, Bumblebee with the Energon Driller. And the Driller came out, and it was a repaint. This the, the Driller came out earlier on, and then it was a repaint, and it came with a little Bumblebee. And that was at Ross for like twelve bucks. And I didn't live in an area with Ross, so I could never find one. Uh, mm-hmm. And I didn't want to pay eBay prices for it. And so, like, this is something that certainly does happen uh, every few years or every other year uh, with these. But never as uh, have I seen it in this large of a number. And I think that's the bigger effect because I think long term, this is going to affect the fan community in, until until things correct themselves with Hasbro, with Hasbro's financials, with um the t- pricing within Hasbro and the toy industry in general, because they're the prices are a little bit out of control in terms of uh, in relation to people's incomes and, and cost of living and inflation and all that fun stuff that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a little while for everything to correct. <laughs> and it might mean a year or two with smaller lines or less transformers available. But I think uh, there is going to be a Ross effect where people are gonna like, no, like, I mean, part of me is like, I missed out on a lot of Toxitron um Mm -hmm. didn't show up my walmarts didn't carry it and i'm still trying to find the sideswipe from from i'm trying to find sideswipe and dead end from that uh series and my thoughts are well they might show up at ross in six months and Mm -hmm. you know then i'll then i'll do the ross hunt thing because there's a million rosses around here but Mm -hmm. um yeah, to 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 that point, I think there is going to be a longer term effect that that we're probably not really thinking because it's going to it has it's already changed the collector mentality in terms of buying retail, paying full price, um, and I think that's that's the bigger danger to Hasbro, it's bigger danger to Transformers as a brand uh, than just having a bunch of toys in in discount store. Yeah, absolutely, and I I think one of the things that that you touched on that that I I wanted to dig into is you know what what this does to consumer confidence and it's like you know how many social media posts have we said oh well you know I'll just I'll just wait for Ross I'll just wait for Ross and that's that's kind of dangerous thinking and the other thing kind of in tandem with that is thinking about 
when this glut of toys at these discount stores eventually ends, you know, where, where is the end, you know, that kind of thing. It, and it feels like a lot of the stuff that we've seen has been like last year's stuff, like, you know, like Tiger Force Outback. And, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the newest thing, uh, that I've seen there. And it's like, you know, some of the Marvel Legends stuff is all from like last year It all. It all feels very last year, but I think what will make me feel, uh, feel like we're towards the end of the run is when we start seeing stuff that's newer for lack of better term. I don't know when maybe stuff from earlier this year uh, from or from 2023. I don't know because like, yeah, I, th- I think everything that I could think of that we've seen is at least a year old. Um, But yeah, no, I just uh, with regards to what this does to the market and what this does for pricing, um, I had mentioned that TFCon was in the middle of, of the Ross glut. And I, 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 I'm in a couple different collector groups on Facebook and, you know, both for GI Joe classified series and for, uh, transformers. And it's kind of interesting how folks have kind of tribed out into a few different groups. You have, well, maybe a couple different groups. Uh, a few different groups. I mean, you you have flippers, you have collectors, and then you have kind of like the folks like me in the middle, where it's like I've I've sold some stuff, but mostly it's for like friends um, or collecting stuff for toy drives and and maybe grabbing some stuff uh, for uh, uh, for myself as well. But it's weird how kind of tribal it's gotten, and like a lot of the discussion uh, factors around price. It's like if I didn't specifically have the plan to gift that one cosmos that I found, and that was even a conversation at home. Like I, um, I, I came home and I told Lucky, I was like, I pull him out of the bag. And I'm like, I found him. And, and she, cause like, it was funny. I was, uh, like that morning I'm in, uh, I'm in a couple Facebook groups, but I'm also in like this group text within a group. <laughs> oh, it's too many different layers of inception there. But like um, there's basically what, what the purpose of it is, is like there's the main group that everybody sees. But this is kind of like we're, we're like in a side alliance. This is like the real, real. You know, we're, we're like the, uh, you, know, you know, factor 25 or, or whatever, you know, like that, that mega alliance. Um, but it was like more or less it's like we're going to you know post our hunting picks to ourselves and not to the larger group because it got a little too spammy the admins and mods were like stop it with all the ross finds if you if you want to do your own thing you're you're clogging up the group um that's i think one of the tipping points that we knew that like the ross effect was was kind of taking in where like everybody was posting what their local finds were like that particular day and that 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 does get a little spammy but there were um, so many conversations around price and finding Cosmos. And it's like, we, we were convinced Cosmos was gone. We were never going to see it again. And that day, there were three sightings locally, all within like 50 miles of me. And I'm like, you know what? I got this feeling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check after work. And I went at nighttime. And I, I walked in and he's on the bottom most corner, um, you know, like totally in an innocuous spot on a peg with two clamp downs. So it's like clamp down, clamp down cosmos. And then like a night bird behind him or something like that. Um, so anyway, so that, that's, that's how I found cosmos. But like I came home and I told lucky, I was like, I had a feeling I knew he was out there and I found one. What do I do now? You know? And she's like, well, what do you mean? I go, well, this is something that has value to it. I go, I want to give it to my friend, but like, should I charge him for it? Because like, um, full disclosure, I, 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 I found some other stuff at Ross for, uh, uh, for the same guy. So it's like, you know, I found him like, uh, uh, found him a Marvel legend, saber tooth and, uh, and one of them mad marauders barbecues and, uh, um, and what else? Oh, and a uh, crock master. Um, so anyway, so, so I found a bunch of stuff. So like, you know, I had this cosmos and I'm like, well, what do I charge him? You know, do I 
do I charge him $7.99? You know, do I charge him 15 bucks double retail? Do 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 I charge him like whatever market rate is, which is like, I don't know, like 40 to 70 bucks or whatever. And my wife always has, I mean, she she's my true north man because she's just like, just give it to him. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, and and that and that just clicked it, and I immediately felt better because I was feeling weird about it, uh, because like I'm not accustomed to finding stuff like that. You know, it's like you know I, I talk about like Clampdown and Crasher and all those, but it's like that's not as big a deal. Whereas like I found the thing that everybody is looking for, so it's like, um, but anyway, so but it reminded me of when I was at TFCon. And people were, a guy had like a half dozen Cosmoses and he was selling them for 80 bucks each. And I looked at him and I could see where the Ross sticker was. Cause I've, I've bought enough Ross stuff to where I know where the, where those stickers are. And, and I will also say that the Ross price stickers, I don't know what kind of glue or adhesive they use, but, but chef's kiss, those come off very easily. It's, it's a very soft adhesive and if you usually there's a corner already curled up because they're they're temporary price tags like they they just slap them on there and they 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 peel off so nicely so easily it's it gives you a lot of good action for it it's very satisfying to take off uh, uh raw stickers um uh, very little ripping but anyway it's like so i could i could see the little little patch of residue in the middle and i'm just like i don't know i just felt bad about it like you know they you know, they were selling, uh, uh, other vendors were selling crashers for 40, uh, shadow strips for 60, you know, uh, uh, blurs for 30. I mean, who's going to pay 30 bucks for a Velocitron blur? What are we doing? And so it's like, you know, I, I, that kind of made me feel kind of weirdly jaded and icky about kind of like what this, what this Ross effect was having. And, um, I think think I got myself too deep into what, what I was talking about. I think I was talking about pricing. Yeah. But basically, like, what, what this Ross effect has on what fair market value is. It's like, you know, if you find a crasher at a Ross, how much is it reasonable to sell it for? Like, I, um, I found a couple headmasters. Um, I gave some to Michael Andrews for his birthday, but he didn't want all of them. So I had some headmasters left. I put them up in a group and ended up selling them for... Uh, double Ross price. So it's like, like I was asking 15 bucks for them. Um, Still less than original retail. By like yeah. 10 bucks or, yeah. or eight bucks or what, whatever it was. I Were those 20 bucks at retail? Those are 20 bucks. Those, they were 1997. I think they were 1984 when they first, uh, okay. I think okay. Walmart did like a gimmick price uh, when they first came out. Oh, that's funny. I didn't even know that. Um, I, I never saw any of them in my, in my Walmart's. Um, never saw any of the the retro headmasters. Uh, but anyway, like those are the only ones that I I like sold to strangers. Everything else I've sold to friends uh, for basically what I paid for it. So I I don't I don't even know what that does to the market. It's like you know how much should you sell a Crasher for? How much should you sell a Cosmos for? How much should you sell a Clampdown for? You know you know that kind of stuff. I, I, you know a, a Studio Series eighty six Cliff Jumper. It's like and the the way I've had it explained to me is like, well, there's there's just been a flood of inventory that doesn't necessarily affect the resale price because um, like and this was like the in the example of the TFCon thing. It's like, well, the people selling those Cosmos for 80 bucks, they're selling them to people on the convention floor who don't have Ross near them and or don't want to do the legwork. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I. I don't know if I buy that or get on with that, but, but what I've also seen is that prices for a lot of these items new are going down as well. Like, you know, me again, like you go to Amazon and look for Joe classified series, you know, you could pick up or Zorana for, for 15 bucks. You, if at this point, if you're paying more than $11 for either Tomax or Zaymont brand new, you're probably paying too much. Um, uh, man, I sure would like to uh, have an Ollie's near me to where I could get like some of those $6 Crimson Guards, but whatever. I mean, I paid full price for two of those, but, um, and then that's where yeah, I should shut up in a sec, but like, I, cause where I'm also drifting is like another after effect of this is kind of the, I don't want to use the term regret, uh, but like in collecting, 
there there are things that sting a little bit. Like I I remember last year I paid full price for Tiger Force Wakando at at Target because I was just so f- glad to find him. I'm like, oh hey, I get because like I'm line complete on both uh, Tiger Force and and Python Patrol, and I was like, I'm gonna pay full price for him. Same thing with like uh, Python Patrol Crimson Guard, who's not crimson at all. He's very yellow. Um, but but anyway, it's like so. There's some of these figures that I just want, and I'm just like, I'm gonna pay full price for it. Um, when Target starts clearancing stuff out, you know, and Rakondo goes for like eleven ninety nine, I'm kicking myself. I'm just like, why did I pay that for that? What? Why? Why did I pay uh, thirty two dollars for for a deluxe Boba Fett? You know that kind of thing. And eventually, you see these on deeper discounts. You see them on sale, and you know, I I see Tiger Force Outback, and so I think I'm starting to get my feet under me of like the thing I'm trying to ask and what I'm trying to discuss. Um, it's interesting in my time what I've seen as like the toy cycle, especially for like exclusives. Let's use Tiger Force Outback as an example. Tiger Force Outback comes out, and he's super rare. Like the resellers are selling him for forty five bucks. I went to uh, it was at TFCon Chicago last year. Not not this last October with Orlando, but the year before, uh, twenty twenty two, uh, Chosen Prime was selling him on the floor for forty five bucks because Target had him sold out. You could not get him. Shortly after that, around Christmas time, um, he starts showing up um, in stores and on the website for retail. That's when I decided to get him because you know I wasn't going to pay forty five bucks, but I did want him. And I'm like, oh man, gonna get 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 myself a, a Tiger Force Outback. Um, so I pay full price for him. Later, he goes on clearance, and then now um, he's at Ross. So it's fascinating to me in the category of consumer confidence what that does. Like I said, I'm line complete on um, Tiger Force and Python Patrol. Like the latest wave with like the uh, televiper and the trouble bubble and uh, the, the Cobra officer and Copperhead, I'm not buying them because I know they're either going to go clearance or they may even show up as an outlet. So like me as a consumer, like my collector journey over the last year is like um, I got off pre-orders and that had some unintended consequences because I was more impulsive about buying stuff in the store when I saw it. I'm like, ooh, the thing I didn't pre-order, here it is. Um, And not being patient enough to wait for sales. But for any number of things, I was patient. And my patience was rewarded. Like, I I paid 22 bucks for a scrap iron. You know, that's a $45 figure that I paid half price for because I I waited. Plus, that stuff went uh, super clearance very quick. Conversely, though, I paid full price for... uh, Dead Ironhide and Dead Prowl, almost dead. Uh, no yellow eyes on that one. But um, but anyway, it's like I I wanted it and I was feeling impulsive. And I'm like, oh man, I'm never going to see this again. I'm going to pay I'm going to pay fifty five dollars for the for this two pack of figures. Uh, within like two weeks, it was it was on clearance, like half off clearance. I should have waited, and um, because like I I saw that with the buzzworthy stuff. Like I, I paid full price for silver streak a couple years ago. Cause I wanted it ended up being half price. And now he's, he's rotten at dollars. You know, if you can't find a silver streak for less than 10 bucks, that, that that's a you problem, that kind of thing. But what I don't know what this effect has had on me for what my buying habits are going to be in the next year. So Anthony, finally, after another 42 <laughs> minutes of setup, laying a lot of track, one of the things that you and I have talked about in our text thread is how your collecting habits have changed. Like, you know, you, you said you backed way off of pre-orders and, um, and you're just, there, there's a separate existential dread with in terms of like pricing and uh, flooding the market. Um, could you talk a little bit about where you're at in your collector journey and how that might overlap with this with this Ross effect and um 
I'm just going to call it the Ross effect, even though it's like Ollie's and TJ Maxx. And everything. Sure, sure. So I think for me, you know, my my collecting journey, I've died. I mean, I have a wall of toys behind me uh, and, and I have one to my left and one in front of me. Uh, so I have, you know, I have learned I have really worked really hard this year to to dial it back, to dial back that that FOMO, really. I mean, FOMO is real. And uh and 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 you know it's funny you mentioned the whole thing with Ross about putting putting stuff back. Um, I I've done that a number of times, just looking mm-hmm. like oh I should, I could pick this up, I can get this cheap. And there is a there is a dopamine hit of one finding the thing and then two getting it for less, you know, feeling like you got away with a deal. Um, so it, it, to me, you know, that's I think that's part of uh, that's part of collecting in some ways, right? So. Um, learning to mitigate that that feeling has been something I've I've worked on this year, and I feel like because of pricing, that's that's a big part of it, right? So I think there's there's two things here we're talking about with pricing. We're talking about retail pricing, and then we're talking secondary market pricing, and they 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 work together. And, and I think the the Ollie's thing plays into that too. So the problem for me with retail pricing, and I feel like this is where Hasbro's financial troubles are stemming, is that they're uh, they're charging more and giving less um, in terms of figures, in terms of accessories, in terms of uh, figure size. I am, I am not one to complain about hollowness on a figure, but I understand the complaint. Um, and for me, I always feel like with Transformers, you kind of need the hollowness uh, on one end of each uh, limb, uh, so yeah. you know you have it facing the right way. Uh, that that's kind of you know I feel like it's a it's an innate directional thing. Um, but for the most part, I understand why people are like, oh, this this doesn't feel. And then when you compare a figure from now to a figure from ten years ago, and, and then you look at the price difference, it's you know, it. it I saw if someone posted um, the new animated Bumblebee. It was you might have. I don't think it was you, uh, but they posted it side by side with the original animated Bumblebee. And like one of these was twenty four ninety nine, the other was twelve ninety nine, and the yeah. size difference it's just massive, massive. Um, so I I feel like. You know, that's that's one thing. I think Hasbro has an issue with price point. Um, the fact that your your deluxe transformer, which is the center of your line, it is the most like it is the largest wave assortment, you know, like you have the most characters per wave in that size class. Um, and you that's the the majority of your peg and shelf space. Uh to have figures at twenty four ninety nine right now, um, it's just not good. It's just not good for forget collectors. Like I, you know, they we we talk about the 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 term. You know, the term kid alt got really popular last year and got floated around. And and I don't know. You know, Hasbro will say that we are a very small part of their their plans. But when you look at what they put out, I I especially over the last six or seven years, it feels like I don't know how small of a part of their plans we are. Um, right. But. When you look at the pricing, we are certainly part of their plans. And what what makes me concerned there is, as a parent, as someone who shops for other people's kids, you know, because if you're going to a birthday party, you have to bring a gift. I don't mm-hmm. buy Hasbro products because they don't fit in that my price range that I need. I want to give something that's fairly, you know, that is under twenty bucks, you know, in that fifteen dollar range. Uh, especially if I don't really know the the family or you know I just got invited because everyone in the class got invited. Um, but I'm looking for something in that 15 under $20 range around $15. And then I'm looking for something that has some, you know, a, a, a good amount of size to it. Uh, mm-hmm. because you want to look like you want to feel like you've given something, you know, you know, substantial to, to and something the kids going to enjoy, whether it's a play feature or, or lights and sounds or something where, you know, the, you, you find out later on the kid loved the thing that you got them, you know? Um, and, I can't do that. I can't give a deluxe transformer for that. I can't give, and on the flip side of that, I can't give a core class figure for that because that fits the price range. But look right. how small they are. So, like, mm-hmm. then it looks like I cheaped out on a gift, even if it's thirteen dollar figure. The other parents might not know that, right? So, so you 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 run that in between. So I'm like, I constantly find myself going to other toy companies when i'm purchasing stuff and i try to look at what i do as a parent because that is the majority of their market like if even if we're look if i've heard generous estimates say that the, the kid alt the collector market is 40 percent of the toy buying industry and i feel like that's generous but that still doesn't account for the other 60 percent so if, if we're if we're 40 percent, which i don't think we are um, that 60% is skipping over Hasbro products because they don't fit price points. 
um and that is on the boys side on the girls side you know whatever like for the most part unless it's a board game it's not fitting in into that into that realm so i think there's a pricing issue with transformers as a collector i can say that as someone you know collectors we follow the lines along so what we're also seeing is a good example is the amazon exclusive um uh nacelle figure that came out oh uh, sure okay the moldy one the one yes, with the, mold. the moldy one black so, mold <laughs> that was that's a Voyager. So Voyagers are at a $35 price point right now. Mm -hmm. But when that figure came out in Siege, it was $22. It's the exact same figure with a different paint job. There are no extras in there. There's actually less stuff in there, I think. I don't remember if, uh, no, Starscream, did Starscream come with blast effects? I don't, he might have. Um, I don't think so. Okay. So, but still at that price point, yeah. like $35 versus the the 22 and even then 22 was like oh that's kind of high for for voyager price point that already hit that first price increase but that right. 22 is still less than what you're paying now for a deluxe figure so you know that's a hard pill for for i think for fans and for collectors to swallow um especially when you look at like the the um capsule figures and the capsule lines which are predominantly repaints and redecos uh remolds and re redecos right mm -hmm. so as much as we'd like to have the the new molding or, or the change of, like if it's a straight repaint that just takes takes the value proposition away right because now you're like i'm paying more for the thing i bought five years ago that is the exact same thing so where why am i paying that price and right. so I think that goes to some of what you're talking about with joe and and reading the market when you're going to pay retail um it's you know you're you're reading is the character popular is the figure short packed is the figure an entire case like so for blue streak you now target especially does a lot of one-offs where one toy is the entire case um that is almost almost guaranteed to be a way for something to be clearance uh because they're just not going to sell through the number of cases they have at full price uh so collector tip if you know it's one per case if you know if the whole case is one toy wait <laughs> uh i know we <laughs> we talked about that in our group chat that was the one one uh uh toxitron figure with cloud cover being the only voyager that i knew yeah i'm like this is getting a clearance i just have to wait and and find it and right around september it yeah i mean the funny thing is my my I, I if you on my twitter i i post a lot about how my my local walmart does the weirdest things and they took those those cloud covers and they went straight to the clearance aisle like they did not even make it onto the shelves in the main aisle um so i think there's that but now you have that cascading effect right so then when you have collectors pulling back and things going to ross and going wherever um it does influence the secondary market and the interesting thing you know as you're talking about there um is ultimately we're talking about margin for hasbro and then the, later on with the secondary market right i think for us as we look at hasbro being this big you know multi-billion dollar company what what we're not seeing is they're trying to make margin right because they're offering same toys at larger prices so they're there there's no cost of development there's no cost of cutting molds there's no like there are things we know as collectors that happen in the toy industry and then they flip a toy around at you know almost 50 percent markup and tell you that it's the same toy with different colors and you're like but you you didn't do anything to deserve that markup and so there are those things in there that that you know worry me as a collector because that's when i you know i i to coin to kind of you know paraphrase the old the old phrase from um, james carville you know it, it's price is stupid it, it is uh, like when you get <laughs> down to it it is the retail price that that is really impacting the collecting industry in a lot of ways it's also the yeah. number of products and, and a lot of other like i feel like we've we've segmented the transformer fandom in a way that uh there is there is a very hard time of, uh, there's something for everyone but the problem is, is because because there's something for everyone a lot of the other stuff is for no one or is not for for someone so mm -hmm. um you hit those that you hit that point where there's a lot of stuff out there that wasn't was for someone but it wasn't for a lot of people and so that stuff ends up in the clearance aisle or it ends up in you know the discount stores so on the flip side of that talking about margin thing you, you know that's interesting to me about your the cosmos guy at tfcon so say he buys 10 Cosmoses at Ross, right? At eight bucks each. Yep. He sells one, he's he's broken even. Yeah. Right? So now the rest is pure profit. So he's gambling on the idea that one person will spend, you know, his full ask 
and he'll be good to go. And if two people send this full ask, he's he's already doubled his money and can figure out what to do with the rest however he wants to, right? Because there, there he's a pure profit at that point. So he can, if he sells them $40 each, hey, I'll give it to you half price. He still turned a massive profit on it. Uh, I think that's the thing. Like, so you're, you're looking at margin because he spent $80. He's looking to make $80 on one. Mm-hmm. And then from there, he he's home free. I think what you're seeing on Amazon and on, you know, for like the Tomax and Zamot thing you were talking about and stuff like that, that's third, that's, that's not Amazon sellers, that's third party sellers usually. So, oh, so what you're okay. looking at there is you're not looking at retail prices getting dropped because of, you know, Ross effect. You're looking at people who bought the thing from Ross and then listed it on Amazon and are sitting on it trying to flip it for twice what they paid on Amazon. Oh, that makes so much more sense. I didn't even think about that. Because yeah. I, I know I know one of your uh, arch nemesis is uh drop shippers. Yep. Well, <laughs> and, and, and that's a little different than this, but yeah, it's mm-hmm. along the same lines in that you know you're you have people who will buy from Amazon and have Amazon hold it and then flip it for a higher price. So if something's really hard hard sought after you as a third party seller you can buy things from amazon let them sit in amazon's warehouse and then when you know sell it as prime because they will eat the shipping on it and Mm -hmm. you know they get i I imagine they get a cut of your sale i don't know it too intimately to know um but you know so if say something you know that's why you can see people take big risk on like you know a $50 $50 figure, you know, some leader class figure, and then, you know, mm-hmm. wait for it to, and then jack the price up to a hundred bucks, cost them nothing to store it, keep it, you know, do anything and just wait for that one person who's going to buy it from them. That's, that's unreal. I mean, I, I'm doing this all wrong. It's like, it's like, <laughs> I, I need to be scooping up all them crock masters and just like flipping them. Like I, so I'm on Amazon right now. Um, You can get, <laughs> A uh, a Zorana for eleven dollars and thirty three cents, but shipped and sold by somebody that's not Amazon.com, right? Yep. But as far as my Amazon goes, you know, yeah, it's it's interesting because, like, you know, I click on it. Oh, uh, tell me who it's shipped through. Uh, brand GI Joe. Uh, with, I don't necessarily see it. Free shipping with Prime. Okay, I and and even in this listing, I don't even see who the um the seller is. But like um, you know, Mad Marauders uh barbecue fifteen eighty nine, uh Zaymont nine dollars seventy five cents, Tomax nine dollars forty nine cents, um, and then it just kind of goes up and actually everything. Well, let me see, spirits twenty dollars ninety cents, stalkers thirteen ninety nine, um, scrap iron is thirty five dollars. That's yeah, I mean, so we're getting less than retail. Dusty is sixteen dollars forty five cents. So yeah, it's it's just kind of interesting. Uh, oh, poor movie Snake Eyes, still thirteen dollars for that. Yeah, guy. I was gonna say if you can't find Baroness in single digits, you're you're having yeah <laughs> having a hard I, time. I was gonna say how much does a Kiko go for? Um, <laughs> so you know, one more thing to to your point <laughs> about re- you know reading the market. I think this just it, and this is aside from just pricing um, as a collector, just the as a tip from someone who's been around a long time with gi joe the trick you know is the the thing you're looking for is joe joe collectors love to troop build Mm -hmm. so if you're waiting on vipers or or any sort of generic character to go on clearance uh you better be there when it does because they will go fast um and then but on the flip side of that named characters particularly joes who aren't in their typical deco will likely go on a hard clearance because uh there's just not the same kind of market for those there's not there's not someone there's not one collector buying up three or four or five of them at a time they're buying one uh even if they're buying it on clearance they're buying one so right. so the those will sit and those will be out there longer and then of course the case assortment thing still applies so like uh scrap iron's a good example because like I, I don't remember if he shipped by himself or he shipped with snake eyes but the, there's there's a lot oh, of yeah. yeah. So either way, there's always a lot of snake eyes out there, um, especially at this point in the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can wait till both of those go on clearance. I mean, some reason my local Walmart still has uh, has scrap iron and snake eyes from that that wave. Uh, has a ton of shipwreck, and then also has uh, uh, retro Baroness and Lady J in droves in the main toy aisle. So <laughs> so Unreal. if you need one, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I I just paid five bucks for for a retro carded Lady J 
I, I already have one mint on card, but I was like, I like that figure. So I bought another one just to open and mess around with. So now I've got um, uh, Retro Lady J and Classified uh, uh, Lady J, and it's just, uh, you know, Street Fighter 2, you know, Player 1, Player 2 colors, you know, th that kind of thing. <laughs> um, I've got a lot of figures like that where you could just put, like, sometimes the 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 repaint is so mild that yeah it's just, it's very much like player one player two uh type of thing um but yeah that's so i i guess i guess from there well one i i really appreciate the insight on kind of the the cycle of this because i again i'm still relatively young in the hobby so there there's like a lot of stuff that i haven't seen like i haven't seen these cycles before and i've never seen anything in the discount stores like on this level and and it's interesting like i had said earlier you know it's like i i pick up stuff now that i barely want like i i got like a, a dk3 breaker for 7.99 i'm like do i even want this figure he's kind of fun though actually like uh that the, that's the trail breaker that's trail breaker in blue yep I was gonna say I have him. I literally have yeah. him. I was like, I feel like I forgot the name of this guy. He was literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I haven't, I haven't sat in this spot in a while. So like, and looking around the room, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I was like, yeah, I forgot I got that. But the, yeah, it, it is really nice. It's it's a good uh, it's a good little transformer. And I haven't cracked open uh, my Trailbreaker from Earthrise, so it's nice to get mm. to like, play with the Earthrise, the Trailbreaker version, and it's molded out. I haven't never opened that yet. So from here, I guess, I guess one thing to kind of do is like, I don't know, like, like a capstone on, on kind of the Ross effect topic is, uh, what do you make of Hasbro's ongoing financial difficulties? Like it's, and it's very weird because we, we get very tribal about like, you know, our favorite brands and stuff. It's like, well, classified series is flying off the shelves. Well, but it's also ending up in deep discount outlets as well so um like uh, massive layoffs have been announced and uh, consumer confidence is kind of taken a hit and to say nothing about the ongoing economy but i guess as uh um uh, what what's kind of your take on where hasbro is at beyond beyond maybe what we've uh what we've already talked about yeah, uh, I don't think Hasbro's at a place that a lot of other companies aren't. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I work I work for a professional services firm, and uh, and I work on the operations side. So I, I I am I always you know we we always joke we are overhead. <laughs> we we uh, we cost the company money, and uh, and I I always say we went through a round we went through we started layoffs in February and kind of they implemented them a few months at a time all the way through August. And so mm. it was a tough year for us. Um, and and we were profitable. So like we knew we were making money, but we weren't making the money we wanted to make or had planned to make. And that's what a lot of companies are going through right now. And then, you know, going through December, hearing about layoffs in the media industry, I had friends, uh, I have a, a former colleague of mine, she got laid off from her job at CNBC. I, like I was seeing it a lot on my my LinkedIn, um, just people in the media industry getting laid off, I, th I yeah. believe. You know, Spotify dumped a lot of people. I think Yahoo dumped a lot of people. Um, you know, it's happening. It's ha and and Hasbro, as much as its toy company, is also you know a media company. At least that's how it was positioned under prior to Chris Cox taking over as CEO. Um, I think you know you're going to see this uh, with Hasbro and probably a few other companies for probably a good another three months or so. Like you're you know I don't think the economy is going to turn around. Everything I've heard. Um, and the funny thing is, is like, I, I don't I, like, I, you know, uh, I'm a video producer at a place that works with financials. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I, I get to glean a lot of what they talk about uh, at times. And so, well, you know, everything I have heard from in, within where I work is that the economy is probably poised to turn around in a few in about three months. Mm. Um yeah, that's at least that's what they're predicting. That's what they're expecting. You know, that's where the all whatever indicators they use are pointing. Um, so it could be that Hasbro will, you know, do their layoffs. I think, you know, the thing with layoffs, especially when they haven't done them, but they've announced them is people will start leaving and then those jobs just don't get filled. Yeah. So you'll see you'll see layoffs and the, the Hasbro layoff announcement also was worldwide. So I don't know how much that's going to affect. I mean, it's going to affect Hasbro U.S. All right. We already heard, heard about the the um, Providence office closing. Um, 
which for us as Transformers uh, folks, I don't know if that affects us all too much because most of the people uh, we see and work, you know, work with on, on the press side are based out of the Pawtucket office. Right. So, so a lot, and that's the main headquarters. So I, I think uh, hearing that the Providence office closed, which funny enough, it was directly across the street from where they had uh, Hascon that one year. So, oh, sure. <laughs> so it is right across the street from the convention center. Um so, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I would say Hasbro has some bigger things to figure out. You know, I, I hear Chris Cox make statements that worry me uh, as a fan um, because it doesn't seem like they know what they want to be. Uh, I feel like, you know, prior, uh, God, why can't I, Brian, was Brian Goldner was the previous CEO? I think so. I he I felt like he had a vision for Hasbro transitioning into being a media company to some right. extent. Um, I feel like you know the paradigm is very different um, with the toy industry, and I just feel like I don't know. It feels like Hasbro has shifted very hard into being a media licensing company. Um, in that they they know they have these brands that are instantly recognizable that there are beloved. Uh, things under their umbrella with Hasbro, with Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Power Rangers, and My Little Pony, and and things along those lines, that they rather sell the rights to other companies to do them than make them than take the risk and make them themselves as far mm-hmm. as toys go, as far as licensing goes. And that worries me. Um because it just feels like now now they're they're gonna spread they're they're gonna spread things too thin if they continue that route, and I feel like that's where we're already at. We're already at a very yeah. close to saturation point, as we're talking about. Right, things are ending up at at um, these discount chains, not just because um, there's a glut there's a glut of product. There are uh, there's a glut of lines. There's a glut of just you know visibility. Like I think. You know, one of the things that really pains me about 2023 is how forgotten Earthrise was uh, from the toy side of things. Um, that you know, in in the in when I got into collecting in '96, um, there was only Beast Wars, and you know, as far as mo- mo- modern stuff, um, and I feel like that was actually you know because yeah, it divided people to some extent, mm-hmm. but it focused the line. It focused the the budgetary, the internal budget on creating a toy line. It focused their media on selling one toy line. Um, and now it feel like, you know, this is something you touched on a little bit in the world uh, uh, episode is that um, the there there's a disconnect from seeing the thing, buying the thing. And yeah. I feel like that is very much a Gen X thing. Um and I don't know, I mean, I'm trying to observe it with my daughter to some extent, but mm-hmm. she's five. And so there is a bit of a see the thing, buy the thing. Um, she will see a commercial, like we we have, we watch Disney Junior a lot and they have commercial breaks in there. So she she will see the commercial for something and be like, I want that. I will, we'll, we'll ask Santa for it. And like, that'll be like, she'll say that in March and we'll like, well, you know, ask Santa for it. And then. Our par- our job as parents is to see if she says it again come December, right? Right. right. So, um, so and there are times where she has, um, and so I feel like there there is a little bit of see the thing by the thing with that, um, and there's a little bit of see the thing by the thing with YouTube, um, which depending on how you want to parent your kids, um, could be good or bad. Like I, I we we let our daughter watch a lot of YouTube when she was when she was younger, and then we pulled back because we didn't like what we were seeing from from how the algorithm even the youtube kids algorithm what it was serving her um and but there is definitely an um a see the thing by the thing and so much of it was funny like she watched one video because there are people who are just looking to cash out on on the youtube algorithm right um of there was one video she watched of uh you know some some woman who went through a um uh, it's it, it's a brand called Imagine Ink, which we had it. It was I, as kids, I think it was called Magic Ink when we were kids. It's just okay. like a book. It's a book, and it comes with like a special like water pen. And as you scribble on the book, it reveals stuff on the page. Mm-hmm. She went through a Disney villain. There, there's a YouTube video. She went through this Disney villains one, and the woman went through every page and filled it in. This is like now a 20 minute video, and my daughter would watch it over and over again. And she said, "I want I want that book." And oh yeah, sure you do, honey. Okay, right. And then so I was like, well, she was watching a bunch of times. I was like, let me see. And this is probably about a year ago, right? It was probably right after Christmas, a little bit about the beginning of last year. And 
I looked on eBay and I couldn't really find it. And I was like, I'm not paying what the one, the three people that have it on eBay are charging like 12 bucks for like a $3 book. <laughs> like, so one day I'm in the drugstore and I see it on the rack. And so it was, it was paying CVS prices for it, which if you want to know what things are going to cost in 10 years, go to CVS. And <laughs> so I went, I was like, but it was six bucks. So I was like, I'll buy it. I bought it. I was like, we'll give it to her for something. And I forgot I had it. I stashed it in here. I forgot it was here. And I'm like, crap i forgot to give it to her for birthday so i i threw it in her christmas stocking this year and lo and behold she goes pulls it out she finds it right and then yesterday go <laughs> now i'm giving that away so uh yes. christmas day um she um she she's like oh i want to play with this uh, among all the other things she's and she's like i saw i watched a video with this I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You're, you're five. How do you remember the one video that you watched that you stopped what we we stopped making letting you watch YouTube months ago? And she still remembered it. Um, wow. so like there is a very strong see the thing, buy the thing connection. Um, I don't know if Hasbro has a good grasp on that because they're trying to serve so many little niche markets within their lines. They're they're trying to serve for transform now strictly speaking speaking strictly speaking with transformers, right? Yeah. There's legacy that's trying to serve a bunch of different things, right? There's studio series, which is now trying to serve a bunch of different things. It's trying to serve movie. It's trying to serve 86. It's trying to serve uh video games, you know, with the 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 the, the other video game line that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's Earthrise. And then there's retro, and then there's the capsule series that you have three different stores, you know, two stores in Amazon carrying. Um, you know, to last year there was bot bots like there, and then you have Rise of the Beasts as a whole other level of here's deluxe, and here's some small stuff, and here's the battle masters, and here's all these different things. Um, so and then you know, and I think last year was probably a result of COVID in a lot of ways that they spread so thin, but. You still had red. You still had, uh, you know, a couple of other different lines, and I feel like, you know, you had uh, selects, which I don't really feel like we have much of anymore. Yeah. Um, but you're trying to serve all these things, and now still retailers aren't carrying them. They aren't moving them, and I feel like a lot of ways because there's that disconnect that is caused that some of that is part of you know I the pricing is the big thing, but the creating the new audience, breeding the new audience, right? You know, when I when I went to my first Botcon. The Hasbro rep, you know, made it a point, you know, because it, it was very non-collector focused when you talk to the Hasbro rep, right? And one of the things they said was, you know, there's a new batch of five-year-olds every year. And and I think about, like, when I got into Transformers, I was five or six, like, or I was probably closer to six at that point. Mm -hmm. But, like, I was already into GoBots. I was already, you know, like, there was, there was that, that, that's where that, that forms, right? And I don't know if Hasbro has pushed EarthSpark enough or even previously Cyberverse or before that Robots in Disguise 2015, like they, all those are very high quality transformer shows that old time, you know, fans, the G oneers, you know, yeah. um, should embrace For folks that look like us. <laughs> yeah. Because like they're, they're really well done shows. They are very entertaining shows and they have enough myth and lore that they're, they're, that they're, they're appealing to a sci-fi fan or, or, you know, a, a genre fan, you know, I always say super, Transformers is really a superhero thing because, like, when you get down to it, they're a Marvel superhero team, and uh, and so is GI Joe. When right, when you get down to it, um, and so like they should appeal to that group without having to go, hey, you know, remember, you know, get the member berries out and let's remember that thing. Um, and I feel like they've leaned so hard into that. Hey, remember this thing? Remember that thing? That they haven't cultivated the new thing because when you look at it, like. How what sells in, in Earthspark, even to fans like me and you, it's Nightshade, it's um, you know, it's Thrasher, it's 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 the new characters. Um, and, and like those are the things, like if there was just one line or two lines and they had, you know, this was a generations Earth Spark line, people those would be moving, those would be the the yeah. main parts of the line. Um, so I feel like there is a lack of focus uh within what Hasbro does. And it's funny because I had this group chat and I, I texted, I remember I texted you about it. Um, my, my old time transformer friends, we, we have this, this group chat and um, one of them had just mentioned that he had picked up the uh, reaction, uh, not reaction, uh, reactivate, reactivate. Just, yeah. Um, and reaction is a whole other, whole other weird argument about how Hasbro is doing. Right. Um, 
because again, talking about licensing things out, they're going to do O-ring GI Joes next year, and that's like that used to be Hasbro had rules about their product. Third parties don't do O-ring GI Joes. They don't do transforming transformers, and well, right now they still don't do transforming transformers, but that could happen. And like, yeah. especially when you're seeing them doing O-ring GI Joes, so it makes it wonder where is Hasbro's stance on their own product? What are they? What is their what are they offering that I need to get it directly from them? Um, but to go to, um, what was I talking about? Art Spark. Uh, I lost group my text. Name. Group text. Thank you. Yeah. So um, in that group text, uh, you know, a friend of mine was, was really impressed with how, um, how well done the uh, reactivate figures were, um, how they were kind of a throwback to older designs, uh, like design um, uh, engineering for the, for the figures. Okay. And, um, you know, I was like, well, one, they sat, they sat on this, they, those designs were supposed to be announced in February, 2021. Um, those figures just for whatever reason, uh, you know, because of all the, the stuff with the game did not come out. Uh, those designs were probably part made, created by an old design team, but they are also very large for their price point. Um, and so I was like, well, there's the value proposition, right? The figures are smaller and the conversation splintered off and we're talking about things we collect or why we collect. And everyone had, you know, a different reason and different kind of, well, this fits my lost light shelf or, you know, I buy this specific character or I do this specific thing, or or I like when they, you know, I, I'm not, I'm never buying an Optimus or a Bumblebee again. So I have no reason to. I'll wait till they do something unique and interesting. And I'm like, everyone has these different approaches to collecting. And because the line is spread so thin, you have whole chunks of lines, like we were talking about before, that just go unnoticed, untouched, un, you know, part, no, no one, there's not many completists anymore. Even I, at, who has probably been a completist for a long time, um, just know I can't be. And so even if I want to just do it for the website to try to fill in the photos, um, it just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and I think about it, I'm like, there is not probably not a single line that I've ever completed uh, as a whole. Like there's always, I can probably name every, like if I look around, I'm like that line's missing this, that line, like looking at my Beast Wars shelves behind me, I'm like, I know I don't have a taco tank. Like I know which ones I'm missing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so certain things like that, like, so the fact that, and I, and I do that, I do an episode at the beginning of the year every year for like, it's a great time to be a Transformers fan. And one of the things I always point out is how, how much there is available for everyone. And I'm starting to rethink that. And that maybe that's not such a good thing because we've gotten to this point of saturation. We've gotten to this point of there is just so much available um, that it, it becomes, it, it, it means you can just wait for the next one or the next thing or the, you know what? I don't like that optimist. I'll wait until they do one in three years. Like you got that, you know, you know, good example is, um, and this actually goes to my Ross conversation as sure. um, uh, studio series, ultra Magnus. Um, I never saw it at retail. I don't know if you saw it. I mean, as far as I know, Amazon was the only place that carried it. Yeah. Um, and, and toy retailers. Um, okay. Well, where are the rest of them? So that's what I'm like, maybe I'll see that at Ross because it didn't hit retail around here. And there are whole waves of legacy that didn't hit retail around here. So I keep going, well, that's probably something that's going to end up at Ross uh, because they were just too little distribution of it. But if you don't like that Ultra Magnus, you can wait for whatever the next Ultra Magnus is. But at some point, you're going to hit that diminishing returns because the second mar- secondary market still exists. <laughs> so if you don't yeah. like the next Ultra Magnus, you can go back and buy... Studio Series Ultra Magnus, you go back and buy, you know, Masterpiece Ultra Magnus or whatever. Like, if you're just looking to plug one character into one hole um, and you just want the best version, you can figure now you have so many to choose from that the new one doesn't become that important anymore. So, right. so you've diminished the value of each subsequent Optimus Bumblebee, you know, the core eight characters plus, you know, most of the movie characters. Uh, so that's, that's the Ross effect in a lot of ways, because now what happens is I know I can wait. I can know I can wait till it goes to Ross. I know I can wait till it, 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 it moves on. And so that's where, you know, you end up with, with that cascading effect. And that's, what's dangerous for Hasbro, because at some point, um, now people know, Hey, I don't have to subscribe to pulse. I don't have to buy it at retail. I don't have to pre-order it. 
you know, I'm looking ahead next year and I'm like, there's one figure I'm pre-ordering that I know I'm pre-ordering and that mm-hmm. is Origins Wheeljack. And because Oh, that's, right. Yeah, of course. Because, well, one, because, you know, my pro- proclivity for Wheeljack yes. figures, but two, like the Origins line is sold so well and Target has been so spotty with their in-store distribution with it. I want to make sure I have it. But like, yeah. but that's me. That's not everyone. And so that could be a situation that goes on deep discount because it's going to be one per case. Mm-hmm. Um but you know the way the jazz moved and the way the bumblebee moved it's probably going to sell well right but but that's the thing like you're now you're thinking as a collector you're not thinking retail you're thinking where when how do i get the discount when do i get the discount when do i pull the trigger on the discount so long story short none of that is good for hasbro because the they're waiting for people to say you know what your price is too high i'll wait for a lower price and so ultimately it comes down to it's the price stupid right like you have to get that retail price in line with what people are willing to pay absolutely so yeah it's kind of interesting because i i think another tactic that i've seen hasbro do either intentionally or unintentionally i'm not smart enough to know what what mr hasbro has in mind but like um again getting back to the the joe classified series like they they've had a couple pulse exclusives that have like come and gone like like snow job showed up sold out returned uh the uh, uh the valkyries the the female cobra troopers um were sold out for a good long time and i took the bait when they came back up i was like ooh 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 i got to get it now otherwise they're going to sell out again because that that was a set i'm like you know i'm going to wait for discount and they still haven't been discounted and they probably won't but it's i think it's also just knowing what you want for your collection and it's just like i i know i know i want them and so so yeah so i pulled the trigger on them and uh you know paid full price for them um so i don't know it and it also feels like there there's a certain level of collector cynicism as well you know there, there's just as many has bros out there as there are has blow people out there and and I think you'll always kind of have that to an extent, but um, yeah, I don't know. It just, uh, I, I appreciate you breaking down a lot of this stuff in a, in a way that's digestible that I can actually hang with. Cause like I said, I had a lot of crackpot theories. I'm like, yeah, that stuff was stuck on a boat. That's that. And it's last year's product. That that's why it's at Ross now. But I, I appreciate going on the deeper dive to, to kind of, uh, make sense of things especially with like the cycle that that you've seen before in some of this yeah i think you know a lot of it it's funny because i don't think you're you're too far off in in terms of it being on a boat you know i'm on a boat (laughs) (laughs) i'm on a boat (laughs) i'm on a boat i'm on a boat everybody look at me because i'm sailing on a boat And you know what? I think that's actually a pretty great midpoint to cut it for now. But do not despair, my friends. My conversation with Ant will continue next week in part two of this podcast where we talk about the toy content connection, uh, following up on some of my comments during the World Extra Life live stream, as well as a round of existential dreadcast as we discuss such Lighthearted questions like, is social media dead in the wake of the implosion of Twitter? And is podcasting dead all through the lens of a couple podcasters talking about Transformers? And as a bonus, Ant gives his final, almost final analysis of the Headmasters after me and Michael Andrews recently appeared on Autopod Decepticast to talk about Headmasters and Super God Master Force and the the other Japanese G1 sequel series. Um, all of that and more on the next episode of Mike Seibert Radio, but that will wrap things up for this episode. Thank you so much for listening and for hanging out with us, and if you want to listen to more Mike Seibert Radio, you could subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Like, share, rate, and review the show. Let us know what you like and what you'd like to hear more of in the future. For my guest, the one and only Anthony Bucali, TFU.info. My name is Mike. This has been Mike Cybert Radio. And until next time, tell all I won. Make good choices. Mike Cyber Radio is recorded in Seattle, Washington. Our original theme song is written and performed by Lucia Fasano. Get her music on all streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple Music. And check out her Instagram at Lucia underscore Fasano. 
Our closing theme is A Nice Place to Visit by These Young Fools, used with permission from Michael Geisler. For more music like that, check out Michael's website, bytormusic.com. Special thanks to Andy Lita for our logos and graphic design. He is at GoGoAndyRobo out on Twitter. Become a Mike Cybertronian and join the MSRP Friends and Fans Facebook group. And you can follow me on social media at Mike Cybert Radio on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And check out my YouTube channel for even more videos and subscribe so you never miss a show. Want to be a guest on the show? Send me an email, MikeCybertRadio at gmail.com. <laughs>